All righty. Hi. How's everyone doing? I got to correct Chucky a little bit. The only thing funny about my man Chuck is how he tricked Steph into marrying him. Talk about settling, right? Woo. All right. Hi. My name is TC. I'm our campus minister at the church out in the inner belts. We were our first church plant sent out just about nine years ago. Um, <laughs> If you're wondering about why I said that about Chuck's one of my best friends, so we just, as guy friends typically do, we roast each other. And I've got the microphone, so I get the last talk on that. But uh, let's say a prayer, and then we'll hop into today's message. Uh, Father God, Lord, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, for me, um, this is a homecoming uh, of sorts. Uh, nine years ago, I went out on a church plant, but this is where it all started for me, God in a place full of imperfect people loving a perfect God who loved me through all my weakness, all my failures, all my sin, and helped me get to know Jesus. It's uh, because of Christ and because of the church that he set up uh, that I'm eternally grateful, God. It's my motivation and the driving force behind anything that I do, God. I pray that in my weakness and in my mumbling and fumbling, God, that your word can be presented in a way that just gives you honor and glory. God, I thank you for everything that you've done in my life, through my life. God, I thank you for bringing the people here this morning. God, I pray that your words can sink deep into their hearts and help change their lives and help them bring them closer to you, God. I thank you, and I love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Like I said, this is a, a homecoming of sorts for me. Um, I was the first campus baptism uh, when the church started about 18 years ago. So about 17 and a half years ago, uh, I devoted my life uh, to Jesus. And there aren't many people that go to the Crossings Church that have been around uh, longer than me, and there aren't many people who were not on the original church plant, Chuck and Steph being one of them, Katie being one of them, and I don't really know if I can think of really anyone else that was like not a part of the plant that's been around longer than me. So I've seen some stuff. Uh, I've seen God work like I said, through an imperfect church to do some incredible things. Uh, we went from a church, uh, when I started to come around, of, I'm sorry, Jackson was there as a baby, which is crazy, he's in campus now. Um, um, I got to see God take a group of like 40 people and turn it into whatever this is, uh, a group of imperfect people loving a perfect God that's got a mission to go out into the world and plant some churches. So nine years ago, um, for whatever reason, they decided, hey, we're going to pay you to do this. And they sent me uh, with all my brokenness and all my weakness out on a church plant with 30-something other people. And in that last nine years, you get to learn a lot about yourself when you go on a church plant. And then uh, six years ago, they sent out a church plant to Collinsville. Uh, and then in the middle of COVID, they decided, you know what, we're going to do another one in Columbia. And by the end of the year, we're prayerfully beginning the process of selecting a new location for a church plant. And in the next year and a half, two years, I don't know exact, the exact timetable, we're going to do another one. And I don't know what the inner belt, that's where I'm at, the inner belt over by the airport. I don't know what our involvement will be in that, but I'm praying that God taps some people on the shoulder and tugs on some heartstrings. We get to send some people to help. And then maybe, just maybe, the one after that, we take the brunt of that and give the uh, crossings St. Charles, a break, and we send out the majority of the people. Because I know without some people giving up their comfortability over in Illinois, over in Alton, to, to leave Alton and come over to St. Charles, I may not know Jesus right now. And so for me, I just wanted to give back. And I wanted to be that for someone else, not because of anything great that I can do or anything, but because of what Jesus has done in my life. So Robert called me uh, about 10 days ago. And was like, hey, you wanna, are you back from Europe? I was in Europe uh, with my wife and Chandler and Laura and Marcus and Chantel and about 35 high schoolers. We went to London and Paris and Switzerland and Germany. And he goes, hey, do you want to preach? And I'm like, I don't know, man, I've been gone. I don't know. And then I'm like, well, when else am I going to get a chance to come back and thank the people that have loved me through so much, but then also get to communicate what God's done in my life? Because if God can work a number in my life, I, trust me, he can do a number in your life. Because the things I've done, I felt like were unforgivable, and I'm going to get into that as we go through the message. So no matter where you've been or what you've done, God can work in your life. 
So I was like, if I was coming here, and Ben's also in Europe at a different part for his sister-in-law's wedding, um, who's going to preach over there? So we tap Brian Williams on the shoulder, so we're doing like a preacher swap um, type deal. So Brian Williams is over in the inner belt. I'm here, so you guys get to stick with me, and you're always stuck with Chuck. So, all right. So <laughs> I grew up pretty crazy. Uh, divorce. Uh, physical abuse, not necessarily towards me, but my dad towards my mom, drugs, substance abuse, manipulation, just crazy. And when I grew up, it made me really doubt, like, God, why would you put me in a home like this, with a family like this, with parents like this that have lied and manipulated and done all kinds of crazy things? It made me doubt the existence of God, that God, are you even real? If you love me, why would you put me in this situation? But then, like I said, 17 years ago, uh, and if it weren't for Matt Colley coming out of our plant, I may not be here. Matt was wrestling with a kid who I had walked in on trying to commit suicide. And as he was hanging in his basement, that grayish purple, I don't know if you've ever seen someone who was without oxygen, um, it shook my foundation. I didn't know where my life was headed, and I started to question things. So in that time, Matt started reaching out to my friend. And as I studied with him, they're like, what are some things that you're going to have to do to have a relationship with Jesus. And the first thing he said is, is I need to get TC out of my life. And looking back, I should have been the big brother. I should have been the good influence. I was four or five years older than him. But instead of me being Matt, he's like, I need to get away from him. So by the grace of God, Carrie and Matt I said, before you cut him out, why don't you try to bring him in? And he's like, there's no way. There's no way this guy is going to follow Jesus. So to Eric's credit, relentlessly, he was inviting me and inviting me and inviting me. And to more or less to shut him up, I was like, all right, I'll go to this birthday party thing. It was Juan Black's 21st birthday party. And I was like, I'll go. And he goes, well, if you like everyone, you'll come to church. I was like, fine, I'll go to church if I like everyone. And I went there, and I saw people who were followers of Jesus but they weren't like so stuffy. And I'm not saying anything about other, the people I had experiences with, I just felt like I had to be perfect and that I couldn't fit in. And so I was like, you know what? These people aren't bad. I think I can do this. So I went to church and I heard the worship like this morning where it was not a band and there's nothing against the band. It's not sinful, but I love being able to hear the person next to me and get to see and hear their heart and everyone just coming together to worship God. And I was like, okay, I can do this. And they're like, well, why don't you come to Cross Chat? So I went to Cross Chat, and I heard people, it was like an informal college Bible discussion, not even a lesson. I heard people talk about addiction and pornography and abuse, and I was like, wait, these people go to church? We're not supposed to talk about that stuff. I was like, hey, I can do all that. I, I, I'm a lot of those things. And so I started coming around, and I studied the Bible, and what normally takes people like a month and a half to study, we got done with seeking God. I'm like, hey, let's do some more. And Kara's like, okay, so we studied the Word of God. And I'm like, hey, this is great. Let's do some more. I went through all the studies in about four hours. And I was like, hey, there, we're some water. Let's do this. And Kara, a, a few years later, said, I didn't think he'd stick around seven days, let alone seven years. Now here I am by the grace of God on a church plant as a minister preaching the Word of God. That should not happen because I was a mess. But God did something crazy in my life. And when I met Jesus, all of those doubts about God and about why he would put me where he put me and the family that he put me started to melt away. So in Ephesians 3, when it says this, never doubt God's mighty power at work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. That doubt melted away. For the first time, I was like, God, you are real you love me, you've got big plans for me, and I believed in Jesus, and it changed everything. So like I said, the uh, last couple of weeks, my wife and I have been in Europe, and as people who go on an international trip do, we talk about it, we flex, we peacock about it like we were in Europe. So I'm going to talk a lot today about how we're in Europe. We got to see some pretty amazing things. We got to see Big Ben at noon, chime, tons of people around. It was awesome. Me and Chandler were there. Uh, it, was, it, was ama- it was amazing. We got to see Buckingham Palace and like kind of from a distance, the changing of the guard. Awesome. We got to go, our tour bus is late, so we got to go by the Louvre. 
uh, still incredible. I mean, just ginormous. We got to see the palace at Versailles, another palace in Bavaria. We got to go to Munich or München, as my uh, German friend Zung says. Um, we got to see some pretty cool things. Things that I, as a poor kid growing up, never in my life would I have imagined I'd get to go across the world and see this stuff. I thought it was just for movies and pictures. But the most incredible thing that I saw was the Swiss Alps. It, I mean, just breathtaking. We were in this little village town. We got on this boat, and we went across the Lake Lucerne, and we could just see mountains. And uh, as we were going across the, the lake in this boat, um, last week, Dimitri from Colombia went to preach at our church because our whole church was in Europe. And I called him. I FaceTimed him. And I just said, hey, Dimitri, I, you got everything you need? Are you good? Let's pray. I pray for you for church or whatever. Um, and as I'm praying, I'm like looking out at these mountains. And I just felt this like weird, like spiritual thing. And I just couldn't help but start tearing up and crying. And I thank God for making the mountains. I thank God for making my friend Dimitri. Thank God, because he's bigger than all of that. All of the cool art and all the cool stuff, nothing was comparable to the Swiss Alps. And it's pretty amazing. You see, God made those mountains. He perfectly carved them out. But that's just a small taste of God's power. When you look into the Old Testament, God parted the Red Sea. And people walked across as if they were on dry ground. He made the walls of Jericho, something that's in our wildest imagination, this huge fortress, come tumbling down. He raised people from the dead. He made the sun stand still. And at the right time, he sent his son down to live a life for each of you, for me, for everyone in the whole world, so that way they could have a pathway back to him. And not only did he lay him down, he brought him back from the dead. But he just didn't just bring him back from the dead. The Bible says in Romans 6, it says, So, do you think we should continue sinning so that God will give us even more grace? No, we died to our old sinful self, so how can we continue living in sin? Did you forget that all of us became part of Christ when we were baptized? We share his death in our baptism when we were baptized. We were buried with Christ and shared in his death. So just as Christ was raised from the dead by the power for the wonderful, the wonderful power of the Father, we can also live a new life. Christ died, and we have been joined with him by dying too. He didn't just raise Jesus from the dead. When I surrendered my life in baptism, he raised me from the dead. Because I was dead in my sin. And if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, it says when you surrendered your life, you got to come up from that watery grave a new person without sin. So here in a second, we're going to take communion. And there's going to be a cup with some juice in it. And that juice represents the blood that was shed so that way your sins could be washed away. And in another cup, there's going to be a little piece of bread. And that bread represents the body that was beaten. It was whipped. The crown of thorns, not just the little thorns, like big briar thorns, twisted on his head. He was mocked and nailed to a cross so that way you could have a way back to him. More beautiful than the mountains, more beautiful than any of the art, the lakes, the rivers, anything, was what Jesus did on the cross for all of us. And so I'm going to say a prayer, and as those things are passed, I want you to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, and I want that to be a driving force in your life, to live a life that glorifies him. Let's say a prayer. Uh, Father God, Lord, I want to thank you for everything that you do in our lives. I know over the last 17 and a half-ish years, and I know I haven't been perfect, but there has been a direction in my life that says, you know what? I want to live for you. I want to please you. And I want to do whatever you have me to do, God. I pray that as we go about our lives, we can remember the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross for us, that way our sins could be forgiven, that we could be a new person and a new creation most powerful example of love, death on the cross that you, you laid down for us, God. So I thank you for everything you do. I thank you for sending your son down to live a life for us. God, I thank you for putting it on the hearts of people to plant a church in St. Charles so that way not only myself but so many other people could hear your word, God. I pray we're faithful to the mission of spreading the good news, God. We love you. 
We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant through the trial and the change, this one power of the grave, constant through the trial and the change, this one thing remains, this one thing remains, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. And on and on and on and on it goes. Yes, it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. And I never, ever have to be afraid this one thing remains this one thing remains your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up, it never runs out on me, your love. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My death is paid, there's nothing that can separate my heart. From your great love in death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. And I know my death is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love. So after raising from the grave, he spent about a month and a half with his people. He ascended to heaven, and Jesus left them and left us with the great commission to go out into all the world, make disciples, to baptize them, to teach them to obey, and Jesus promises to be with us to the very end of the age. Then you get to the book of Acts, and Pentecost happens, and the original church planting movement started. He says, you're going to be my witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And the last time I checked, this was part of the ends of the earth. And we are a continuation of what they started 
in the book of Acts. So this year, our theme was to be continued. We wanted to go from the book of Acts. We wanted to continue the amazing things that they did in Acts. So, um, Hebrews 13 says this, Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, and forever. This is part of forever. And for my 35 to 40-year-olds, when I say forever, you mean forever, ever? Forever, ever? Right? This is part of forever. So Jesus is going to work for us today the same way that he worked with them. Because we can look at the book of Acts and say, you know what, that happened, that was great, that happened 2,000 years ago, but Jesus doesn't work the same way today that he did then, but today is still part of forever, right? And Jesus is the same. So as we live our lives, as we go about our day, we're to go into all the world, we're to teach people about Jesus and spread the good news. You hear me, church? That's why nine years ago we sent out a church plant. And that's why six years ago, we sent out another one. And that's why three years ago, we sent out another one. And that's why in the next year or so, we're going to send out another one. And another one. And another one. We're going to keep sending out church plants because that's what Jesus started. And that's what his church started. So in order to do what they did, we must do the things that they did. And we can look at our heroes in the Bible, and we can look at our spiritual heroes on earth, and we can say, look at them, God is doing some amazing things, and we can like, prop them up, which we shouldn't, because they're humans, and they've got flaws. We can look at them and say, I want that, but are we willing to do the same things that they did? The dedication, the focus, the commitment, the sacrifices that they made. And it can be so easy to say, I want that, I want that, I want that but it's much, much harder to do the same things that they did. So before we start, I want to make a little preface. Each of these points starts with we slash I. It starts with I. I have to do the things that we're talking about today. But collectively, when we come together as a church and as a body of believers, not just St. Charles, but the Interbelt and Collinsville and Columbia, when we come together collectively in the name of Jesus, we can have the same impact that they had. The Bible describes the church in Acts that they took the world, they flipped it, and took it upside down. I don't know if you looked at the city of St. Louis or you watched the news at all, but doesn't it seem like the city of St. Louis or the metro area could use a good flipping upside down and shaking it out? Because we live in a broken world full of broken people. I was one of them, and Jesus got into my life. And if Jesus can do that for me, like I said, he can do that for you. So it starts as I and collectively becomes a we, and we can go out and be an unstoppable church, just like in the book of Acts. So like the Acts church, we and I have a reason to play, pray. We and I have a reason to pray. Faith in the Bible is belief in action. You see, the people of the day didn't just join up, join the cause, commit to Jesus, sit back and do nothing. That's just not how it works. In James 2, it says even the demons believe and they shudder. Their faith didn't move them to action and to obedience to Jesus Christ. So for us, our belief, our faith must drive us to action and living this stuff out. So we have reasons to pray. The first reason, we should pray because of the strength of our extraordinary enemy. We should pray because of the strength of our extraordinary enemy. In college, I took a class. I was a sociology major, which is good for having a degree. And um, I read a book uh, called The Art of War. It was uh, actually a pretty good book. It's a fairly well-known book outside of the Bible. One of the big things that I remember from it is one of the points is know thy enemy. If you're in a fight, you want to know your enemy. And Satan is our enemy, and I hate to break it to you, he's more powerful than any one of you, and collectively more powerful than any one of us on our own. It's the media wants to make Satan your buddy. Oh, he's got the red jumpsuit on, and he's got the cool little tail with the triangle on it, and a pitchfork and costume horns. He's your buddy. He's like Lucifer on the show. He's this suave, good-looking guy that he can be your friend. That is not the Satan of the Bible. That is not who we're fighting against. In John 10.10, 10, it says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 
What part of that screams buddy? What part of that screams best friend? It describes Satan as the father of all lies, like a roaring lion that's ready to pounce and devour you. He is not your buddy. He is not your friend. He does not have your best interest at hand. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. We need to get that straight. Because right now, you flip on the TV, you listen to songs, you watch the Grammys or whatever it was, they want Satan to be your friend, and he is just not that. Like I said, we went to Europe, and we saw some pretty amazing things, some beautiful stuff. But the last thing we saw was a concentration camp. I don't know if you know much about them. If you've ever seen pictures or ever been to one, um, I didn't like it. I've, I'm, I love history, and the history of it was really intriguing to me. But from the second we walked through the gate, I didn't want to be there. I felt weird. I felt strange because of the evil that had taken place inside of those gates. People being beaten, and killed, and starved to death. It just didn't feel good. And uh, last year there was a show on Netflix, and if you watched it, that's your prerogative, the Dahmer show. Uh, people are like, you got to watch this. You got to, it's so good, it's so good. And so I flipped on the first, I couldn't make it more than like 10 minutes in. It just felt evil to me. That's our enemy. You see, he's going to take every situation, every little thing, relationship, every lie that he can twist, every word, relationship, whatever it is, he's going to twist it because he wants to create chaos, he wants to create evil, he wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Seen it in my life. I've been that guy that Satan used to do evil things. But I didn't tell you about the story about my friend trying to commit suicide was the reason or part of the reason he felt like he needed to do that is that I encouraged him to cheat on his girlfriend of like four years and he did. She found out she broke up with him, and he felt hopeless. He should have been the guy who's like, no, dude, don't do that. That's your girlfriend. I liked the girlfriend. I cared about the girlfriend. But in my sin and even in my evil, I encouraged him to do that. And Satan used me to do something. I look back and I was like, why did I do that? We can all be there. We've got an evil, evil enemy. Which brings us to Acts 12, King Herod. Now, King Herod, you may have heard King Herod or the Herod family. They're particularly cruel. They're representative of powers and of darkness. You see, the brother of Herod is the same brother that jeered on the Jews as they arrested Jesus, as they turned him over for mob and cru crucifixion. His grandfather was the one that's, you know what? Hey, there's supposed to be this Messiah that's born around this time, so I'm going to take every Jewish male baby and I'm going to have them murdered. Because if I can stop the threat to my throne now, I'll have everlasting power here on earth. He was the same Herod, the granddad. He murdered one of his wife and three of his own children. And the power that the government gave granddaddy Herod is the same power that the Herod that we meet in Acts 12. He is a man full of hate. He was very ruthless. And here's how he used that power to carry out evil. See in Acts 12, 1 through 5, King Herod got it into his head to go after some of the church members. He murdered James, John's brother. When he saw how much it raised his popularity ratings, you see evil, when it goes unchecked and celebrated, tends to breed more evil. And that's what was happening here. He arrested Peter during Passover week, mind you, and had him thrown into jail, putting four squads of four soldiers each to guard him. He was planning a public lynching after Passover. All the time, Peter was under heavy guard in the jailhouse. Under heavy guard, Herod did not want him to get out. And these, the people that were guarding him knew that if they let Peter out, that they would be killed. And so they were particularly, they were watching him. They did not want him to get away. See, the church was spreading. In spite of persecution, it was spreading everywhere. The Bible says that the, the gospel is the sweet aroma to some while it's the stench of death to others. You see, when I first met Jesus 17 and a half years ago, I was at the end of my rope. I didn't know where else to turn. And for me, it was like, I can't help. This is awesome. This is amazing. I want to get a part of this. And for some of you, it was a sweet aroma that drew you in. 
The Bible also says that for some, it's the stench of death. And I don't know if you've ever smelled something that smells terrible. You don't want anything to do with it. In fact, you may get violence to get away from it. That's King Herod. The, the church and the things and the members of the church were like the stench of death for this evil, evil man. And they, we need to know that. So when God is being found by the lost, it drives him crazy. He starts shoulder tapping people to carry out evil and twisting things, and that's where King Herod was. Think about it. Every time that we get something going as a church, or if we've had some growth or some success, we can look back and Satan was working in the middle of that, but we are faithful through it. We can have a pipe burst, right? Some of the people are laughing, and when we were in St. Charles, we had a pipe burst. We came back from a, a trip, and the whole basement of the church We've had people come, we've had people go, we've had people slander us as a church and all kinds of different things. We've had people caught in sin and selfishness and pride and we look back and if we had let that wrap us up and consume us, we wouldn't be where we are today because Satan was in the background working but it took faithful people and their brokenness and their weakness to rely on Jesus and to work and now we've gone from a church that's 30-ish people to 600-ish year, 150 or so, I'm, I'm not same exact numbers in the inner belt, 120 or so in Collinsville. We've got about 100 or so in Columbia. And we've got a sister church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And in a few years, we're going to have another church and another church. And it's changed lives and changed eternities. The church in Acts knew about the evil. They lived it. And they also thrived in it. Paul knew that behind the evil in the world, there was a greater evil pulling some strings. That's why he wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus. Uh, Ephesus uh, Ephesians 6.12, our fight is not against human beings, but it is against the rulers, the authorities, and the powers of this dark world. It is against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly world. You see, if it's simply against flesh and blood, I'm a wrestler, so I'm going to take my odds. Right, I may lose the fight, but I'm going to try to break something. Right, if it's against the government, I could take a stand against that. But the dark forces... Like I said, when I was at that concentration camp or when I was watching the Dahmers, there's just something evil that's just like, I am not equipped for this. I don't know if I can do this. There's an evil in the world and we must know the enemy because the enemy is so much stronger than us. Which brings us to our second point. We should pray because of the weakness of our very ordinary nature or our flesh. You see in Matthew 26, this isn't on your notes, Jesus described us as our flesh is weak. And in Galatians 5, it says the acts of the flesh are obvious, and it goes through a list of sins about immorality and debauchery and orgies and anger and hatred and discord. All of these different things, our, our flesh is weak. And I don't know about you, I am not perfect. And contrary to every 18-year-old boy's word, none of you are perfect either. We are weak people. In fact, if we could be strong, if we could be perfect, there would have been no need for Jesus. But Jesus looked at us and our weakness and our brokenness and says, you know what, I need to go down to help them. I need to give them something greater. I need to give them forgiveness, but I also need to send the spirit to live within them so they could walk in this world because the enemy is strong, but we are so, so very weak. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the apostles were no different than this. They were ordinary people. And although they had walked and had the best training with the best trainer possible for around three years, they were still weak. And in fact, in Acts 4, it says this. Now the Jewish leaders looked at Peter and John and realized they were typical peasants, uneducated, utterly ordinary fellows. They're ordinary dudes, just like you and me. But God had got into their life. They had an earth-shattering experience with Jesus, and it changed the course of history. And so sometimes when I read through the book of Acts, I can look at these apostles, I can prop them up and say, man, those guys are notch above. But they're just like you and me. They're normal people. They had passed. Some of them were tax collectors. Some of them had anger issues. Thomas was a doubter. And you can look and you can see bits and pieces of yourselves in probably each and every one of the apostles. They were ordinary people that had met an amazing God. They had met Jesus. And it changed everything. You see in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, Paul wrote this, and not because we think we can do anything of lasting value by ourselves, our only power and success comes from God. 
they had some amazing things happening around them. They were changing the world, and they knew the whole time that it wasn't about them. And I can get out ahead of myself. I can get big eyes. I can get prideful. I can think, man, anything that good is happening, I did that. I am so good. That is not the case. Anytime that I've done that, it's turned out horrible. And when you go on our church plant, you learn a lot about yourself. Because I had been a part of a growing church, and I had a lot of really great people around. And when we go on a church plant, me being a guy, being prideful and being weak, I was like, I got this. I tell you, if you ever want to learn about yourself, go on a church plant. Because by myself, I, man, I can do nothing. Anything that good has happened over at the Interbelt has happened because of God's grace and God's power. And I pray that as some of you consider going on a church plant, that you remember that anything that good happens within a church and within the kingdom is because of God's power. And we need to humble ourselves enough to stay out of the way because we're weak and we need God to work in and through us. They knew their weakness was the only way to accomplish their mission to go into all the world, to make disciples, to baptize them, to teach them to obey. They knew they needed that because Jesus said, hey, I'm going to be with you to the very end of the age. That was Jesus affirming, hey, I'm going to be with you because you can't do this alone. Jesus is with each and every one of you as we go about our day. And we need to know that. And you need it because you're weak. I am weak. So we are weak. Our enemy is stronger. And at number three, we should also pray because of the supremacy of our sovereign God. If you had access to the greatest power in the universe, wouldn't you want to use it? I would. We have that kind of access. A lot of you are holding Bibles in your hands. There's never been more accessibility to the Bible. You can get the app for free on your phone and download, I don't know how many different translations. God says that when you surrender your life, you're given, in baptism, you're given the Spirit. We serve a supreme God that's more powerful than us and way more powerful than the devil. And we need to know that. And if we're going to know our enemy and we're going to fight, we might as well have the greatest power in the universe on our side. In fact, in Acts 12, verse 6, then the time came for Herod to bring him out for the kill. That night, even though shackled to two soldiers, one on either side, Peter slept like a baby. And there were guards at the door keeping their eyes on the place. Herod was taking no chances. Suddenly there was an angel at his side and the light flooding the room. The angel took Peter, got him up. Hurry, the handcuffs fell off his wrist. The angel said, get dressed, put on your shoes. Peter did it. Then grab your coat and let's get out of here. Peter followed him, but didn't believe it was really an angel. He thought he was dreaming. Past the first guard and then the second, they came to the iron gate that led into the city. It swung open before them on its own. And they were out on the street, free as the breeze. At the first intersection, the angel left him, going on his way. That's when Peter realized it was no dream. I can't believe it. This really happened. The master sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's vicious little production and the spectacle the Jewish mob was looking forward to. It says that Peter slept like a baby. Peter knew that he had the biggest, most powerful thing on his side. And even if God hadn't delivered him, he knew that he was about to spend eternity with Jesus. So he slept like a baby. He knew that God was on his side. He sent an angel to help him. The handcuffs fell off his wrist. It wasn't like those little trick handcuffs that got the little lever that you can slip out of them. It wasn't like Houdini's where there was a key hidden and he could get out. It wasn't like any of that. The handcuffs fell off his wrist and then they walked past the guards. And like I said earlier, those guards knew that if he got out, that they would be killed. And the doors opened like nothing. Now, for some of you, you may have never seen this show, but one of my favorite seasons of a show ever is the show Prison Break. I know what it takes to get out of prison, and it doesn't happen in a night. It actually takes about 22 episodes, <laughs> a lot of tattoos, a lot of planning, a lot of prep going into it, making friends on the inside, you know, things like that to get out of this prison. And Peter had none of that other than the supreme God on his side that made the handcuffs fall off that helped him to silently somehow sneak past four squadrons of guys, to have the doors fly open as if nothing was there. That's the God that, that we serve. And we need to know that. We have a supreme God and we have reasons to pray. Our enemy is so strong, he wants to devour us. 
And in our weakness, by ourselves, we can do nothing really to stop that other than couple ourselves with God and get on our knees and pray. We have reasons to pray. You have reasons to pray. It starts with I and then collectively becomes we. And if we come together, God can work in our lives. Number two, we slash I should relentlessly pray. We slash I should relentlessly pray. The Bible calls us to pray without ceasing. Does that mean that's all we do? No, Shane, hey, I can't talk to you right now. I'm still in the middle of a prayer, all right? Um, Check back with me never because I'm not ever going to be able to talk to you because all I'm going to do is pray. That's not how that works. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, and in every situation that we get into, the good, the bad, the happy, the sad, sickness, and health, we pray. Sometimes we get on our knees. Sometimes there's a silent prayer on our head. Sometimes it's with people, and sometimes it's not, but we pray. Peter was one of Jesus' apostles, and he had a way of getting himself into trouble. In fact, two of the instances that we see about Peter here in today's lesson, he was in jail. And before Jesus was arrested and taken off to be crucified, Jesus told him, hey, Peter, guess what, my man? I know you're devoted. I know you love me, but you're going to deny me. No, I will not do that. And he like very vehemently denies that. And he says, no, you're actually going to do that. Now, in my pride, if I had told someone, no, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to do everything that I can not to do that because I'm prideful and I want to be right. That's not what happened. When Peter could have prayed when Jesus was taken off, he failed to do so. And he denied Jesus, fulfilling what Jesus had told him he was going to do. I believe that Peter learned a lesson in that instance, that you need to pray in the good times and the bad. And that set a culture within the church. So as he gets arrested, it's his people now praying for him. And I'm not saying that Peter's prayers would have released Jesus, but it may have stopped him from from denying him. And we need to know that. So Peter knew this in Acts 12, Acts 12, 5. All the time that Peter was under heavy guard in the jailhouse, the church prayed for him most strenuously. See, all the time describes the consistency of, of prayer in an unstoppable church. You know, it can, easy to be, it can be easy to praise God in the good times. It can be easy to pray to God in the bad times, throwing out that Hail Mary. Like, God, I just got pulled over. Please, please let this cop have some mercy on me and get me out of this ticket. God, I just lost my job. Please help me to find another job so I can pay my bills. It's easy to pray in the bad times, and we should definitely do that. But we should consistently pray in all times. Because when the bad times come, if we're not praying in the good times, our hearts aren't ready. We're not equipped the way that we should be to handle those bad times. I don't know about you, prayer can be a struggle for me at times. Some days I'm all over it. Like when Peter was in jail, God, please. Sometimes I wake up, I get on my knees, I can pray, I can, as I go about my day. Other times I wake up, I just, maybe I woke up a few minutes late, or maybe when I wake up, the the kids are going crazy, or or I've got an early, early morning meeting and I don't start my day off like with prayer, get to five o'clock, get to dinner time, get to bedtime. And I was like, where did my day go? Where did it go? Where did all my time, where does this pray without ceasing thing? And I've, I've, I missed the mark. Have any of you ever been like that? You get done with your day and you're like, I didn't talk to God one time today. I can be, I've been there. Got social media, all kinds of different things just distracting us. But if we want the results of the first century church, we have to have that devotion to prayer the same way that they did. They need to relentlessly pray. They need to consistently pray. I want the results of the first century church, but I haven't disciplined myself enough to do the things that they did. And prayer was at the heart of the things that they did. Number two, strenuously describes the intensity of prayer in an unstoppable church strenuously describes the intensity of prayer in an unstoppable church. Uh, I don't remember. When you do two services, sometimes they, they blur together. I don't know if I told this story or not. So I'm just going to tell it again. Um, when we were in Switzerland, like I said, the most beautiful thing was uh, the mountains. We went across this lake in Lucerne. And um, as we were going across the lake, Dimitri was getting ready to preach. He came over from... We want to be able to preach at our church. And I remember talking to him and um, 
praying with him before he preached. And I remember looking out at the mountains and just seeing how beautiful it was. And I just was overcome with that emotion. And I don't feel like I've felt that close to God in a while. Not that it's been bad, but this was like especially like one of those mountain, literally a mountaintop experience. And I feel like I've, I've, as I've prayed since then, there's an intensity and then an intentionality in my heart that says, God, you're so much bigger than me. And I feel like I've been reaching out to him more passionately than I have in a while. And it's been really refreshing. And as you pray, that should be the intensity that you search for. Uh, we go to these uh, conferences well, with the Renew Network at times, and there's a man there from Africa. His name is Shadanke Johnson. And if you've ever seen Shadanke pray, it's incredible. He's uh, from Sierra, Sierra Leone. Um, he's probably a little shorter than me, but his faith is huge. He's part of a movement or helped start a movement where I, I believe millions of people have become believers. And when you listen to this man pray, it is just from the heart. It is awesome. He will stop and just start singing random hymns and songs. And the first time you hear it, you're like, what is this dude doing? This is weird. But then you listen to him pray, and you start singing the songs with him, and you're like, wow, this is pretty amazing. And he'll talk like Bible verses and things like that. This man has literally had guns multiple times pointed at his head. He's had meetings with the president of his country. But the intensity of his prayer is what drives the faith of his country. And if we're going to have results like the Acts Church in Acts, we have to have that kind of intensity. In fact, in James 5, it says this, For a tremendous power is released through passionate, heartfelt prayer of a godly believer. We must let our hearts out. We must cry out to God if we're going to have the results of the Acts Church, of an unstoppable church. You see, seven years ago, uh, just over seven years ago, uh, my little sister passed away. Uh, she was a believer. She was an amazing, she was annoying she had a lot of flaws, um, but she was an amazing believer. She got lupus, and then she got meningitis on top of the lupus, the complications, and she had passed away just over seven years ago. And I can tell you, I was not perfect by any means within that very, very hard time in my life. But the two things that kept me going and kept me even with God was God's amazing power and the love of Jesus Christ. And I believe the prayers that so many of you sent out to me and my family and my sister and everyone. And so I, the reason I wanted to come back, I just every time I'm here, I got to just say thank you and I love you all. But I believe it's because of your prayers that kept me focused on Jesus through a hard time. And I said, when the Bible says that I consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, um, the support and love that I have from Jesus and had from all of you, um, although my sister was passing away, Consider it pure joy. And prayer changes things. And we have to be like that for each other. But the church prayed in quotations describes the unity of prayer in an unstoppable church. The church prayed describes the unity of prayer in an unstoppable church. About 90% of the times that a Christian prays and acts, it is together. And that should tell us something. That when we come together, we should pray. If 90% of your prayers are without others, we are missing out on 100% of the blessing of God. It doesn't mean that God won't work in our lives, but he's not going to work the way that he could when we come together. When you look through the book of Acts and, frankly, the New Testament, people prayed together. So when we come together for girl time and guy time, when we're on the phone with each other, when we're just hanging out, we should be praying together. And it shouldn't be just at the designated times before and after whatever meeting we have, it should be more than that. And if we're going to be a group of people that plant churches and take the world and flip it upside down and shake it out, we have to pray together. We have to pray by ourselves, but we also need to come together in unity of prayer. So in Acts 1-4, it says they all join together constantly in prayer. After that, the Spirit comes upon them the day of Pentecost, and it says, hey, you're going to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, and they shook the earth. We must join together in prayer, consistently, relentlessly, and in unity. And number three, we slash I should expectantly pray. We slash I should expectantly pray. Uh, I was up last night at about 1 o'clock in the morning. What were you doing up so late? You're preaching. Shouldn't you get a good night's sleep? Uh, yes, but no. 
Uh, all the storms yesterday knocked out. We meet at Christian Academy of Greater St. Louis. Um, last night, the power was out until about 1 o'clock in the morning. About 11.30, I'm like texting and calling, calling Ben, who's over in Turkey. We're trying to figure out what the best plan is. You almost got a bunch of uh, party crashers this morning. We thought about maybe coming out here and surprising you all. Uh, we eventually landed on, you know, we'll just do house churches. We'll get together in our small groups and just get as many people together as we can. We're just going to make the best of it. And as I'm typing out the message, we've been praying. I know Ben had been praying. I had been praying. We had been on the phone together trying to figure it out. As I'm typing out the plan, I have actually have a screenshot there on my phone. I get a message from the principal of the school. The power is back on. We're good to go. I didn't know what to expect as we were praying through that and trying to figure it out. But I don't know if I was expectantly praying. It was more like, oh God, please just work this out. Yeah, we can get like that. And I don't know if God would have worked it out the way that I thought, but when the Bible says it, hey, uh, Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. Praying for God's will to be done is much better than our will to be done. So if we can pray that and say, God, I want to glorify you, I want to live for you, and whatever you have before us, I just want to be faithful in that, God is going to work. We should expect God to work. We have to expectantly pray. Here's what they did in Acts 12. Still shaking his head amazed, he went to Mary's house. The Mary, who was John Mark's mother, the house is packed with praying friends that were consistently, relentlessly, and praying together, right? When he knocked on the door at the, to the courtyard, a young woman named Rhoda came to see who it was. But when she recognized his voice, Peter's voice, she was so excited and eager to tell everyone Peter was there that she forgot to open the door and left him standing in the street. Can you imagine that? Hey, I'm out of jail. Hey, open up. It's late. They're still trying to kill me. Open up. Ah, Peter's here. Right? And she forgets. It's like, oh, no, I got to go. And they open the door. And it says, but they wouldn't believe her. The friends, hey, Peter's here. No, 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 no. You're imagining that. He's locked up, handcuffs, guards, all that iron gate. There's no way out. Dismissing her report, you're crazy, they said. She stuck by her story, insisting. They still wouldn't believe her and said, it must be an angel. All this time, poor Peter was standing outside in the street, knocking away. Finally, they opened up and saw him and went wild. Hello, hey friends, hello, hey, I'm still out here, All right? They went wild. They didn't know what to expect, but they were praying expectantly, and that's what we need to do, because like I said, when we're faithful to the mission and we're faithful to the call, God is going to work, and it may not be the way that we picture it in our head, but I can guarantee you the God that made the mountains, he made the stars, he made the people with the minds that made all that beautiful art that we saw in Europe. He knows better than all of us. We need to expect that. I work with people, and this is one of the number one things I hear about people struggle with prayer. Sometimes it feels like I'm talking to a wall. I don't know if God is listening. No different than the people in Acts. It says, but they wouldn't believe her, dismissing her, dismissing her report. You're crazy, they said. We need to have hopeful prayers, and not like, I hope this happens, but that confident expectation in Jesus Christ that God is going to work out for the good of those who love him. We have to expect God to work. So I made this thing. Ashley, can you put that picture up for me? So I made this thing. Um, Robert didn't know I did this. It's like a prayers and acts, a six-day reading plan thing. It's the, the verses at the bottom of your notes there. I'm going to kind of rapid fire through these. But I thought you guys might want to do a deeper dive. So on one of the days, you're just going to read Acts 2, and there's the prayer and the result. We're going to put this up on the website. We'll put this up on the Facebook. If you want it, you can get it from me or whatever. And it's just a little reading plan for you all to dive a little deeper in and to see the things that God did through his praying people. Because like I said, when, God, when people pray to God, God works. So in Acts 2, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayer. Devotion is a commitment. And time and time again in the Bible, it says our relationship with Jesus is like a marriage. My wife wants me to be devoted to her. She doesn't want me to stray. She doesn't want me to have any other side women or anything like that. I should be devoted to her. And that's how God wants us to be with his teachings and with prayer. Be devoted. Have a commitment to praying to God daily. 
praying all the times, good times and bad, and here's the result. In Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the number daily those who were being saved. In Acts 3.1, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. You got a devoted a time that you dedicate to prayer? Building habits, building a routine? Peter did. John did. Here's the result in Acts 4. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The church was growing, and it didn't happen without prayer. Because these were just ordinary dudes. They were praying to God, and they were dependent on his power. They were dependent on him to work in and through them, and God worked. In Acts 4.29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. I don't know about you. There's been opportunities in my life where I've been a coward where I had the opportunity to speak about the love of Jesus and I was like worried about what they would think about me. Are they going to reject me? Are they going to walk away? Are they not going to be my friend? How unloving must I be not to share the greatest news with anybody that I could ever share with them? Like the people in Acts, we need to pray for boldness. We need to pray for a backbone because this is the greatest thing that we could ever tell someone. Here's the result. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. That needs to be us, church. If we're going to go out and plant churches, if we're going to make a difference here in this area and in the world, we got to pray for boldness. God wants us to be bold. He wants us to live out in faith. In Acts 6, brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. See, they were so busy with the tasks that they were neglecting prayer, so they delegated some work so they would have time to prayer because they knew that prayer was going to be the thing that drove the church and brought people to get to know God. Here's the result. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. In Acts 9, it says, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. He's saying, hey, Lord, hey, this guy saw, he's killed, he's beaten, he's imprisoned, all kinds of people. This is scary. What do I need to do? He was praying, he was calling out to God in the midst of something that was very dangerous at the time. And here's what it said in Acts 9, 18. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. This guy whose heart was so hard said the scales fell down and he surrendered his life to Jesus. And if you have your Bible, if you go past the book of Acts, that man pretty much wrote everything else in the Bible. Not everything, but pretty much everything else. God changed his heart and God worked because men were praying and devoted to prayer. And finally, Acts 16, 25, above midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Here, Peter's in jail again singing songs and praying, and here's the result. Acts 16, at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer, the one that was supposed to keep him in, surrendered his life to Jesus in baptism. Prayer works, and this isn't like a gimmick. It's not like, hey, I'm going to pray to God, and he's going to work all these special things out. We're praying for God's will to be done, for us to be faithful servants to him, and when we do that, Individually and collectively, God works. I want you all to be praying now for the church plant that goes out in a couple years. I want God, you to pray to God, God, if it's your will for me, let me be willing to go. Because without people doing that for me and a lot of you, you may not know Jesus. We need to be people of prayer because if God's going to work, we got to talk to him. we got to be devoted. we got to relentlessly and consistently pray get on our knees, and call to God because we are so, so incapable of doing it that we need God to help us. Inside your worship bulletins is a cardstock piece of paper. On one side, it, on one side it says, uh, the crossing church where the problem of life meet the power of God. I brought life's problem, God brought his power. A lot of you brought problems, God brought his power. On the other side, there's a place for your information. That's just a baby step. For some of you, maybe it's your first time here. God brought you here not to take anything, but to give you something amazing, and that's a relationship with him. It's just an opportunity for someone to connect with you. At the bottom, we don't do a Wednesday night service. We do uh, what we call Manasseh classes or healing classes. 
for people with hurts, habits, addiction, anger, divorce, abuse, all kinds of different things because we believe that we need to meet you right where you are to help you get to see a powerful God. And then the other half of that's a spot for you to write out a prayer request. Maybe you're going through it. Maybe you just want to praise God for something and share that. All of that is good. I'm going to say a prayer, and then the worship team is going to come up, and they're going to sing two songs. The first one is designed for you to fill out that card. The second one is designed for our members to drop in their card and their contribution. But for our guests, just please just drop the card in. God didn't bring you here to take something from you, but to give you something. It's not that your money is not good enough for us. It's just that we just want you to know that Jesus loves you, um, and he wants to work in your life. So I'm going to say a prayer. And the worship team will come up and sing those songs. Uh, Father God, Lord, I want to thank you for what you do. I want to thank you for who you are. God, you're the God that made the Alps, made the stars in the sky, made the universe. You're the powerful God that uh, sent his son down to live a life for us, to set up the church, to train up some people. And uh, God, I just thank you for them. I thank you for everything that you do in our lives. Thank you for Jesus. God, I pray that um, as the people, again, uh, through whatever mumbling and fumbling effect I did today, God, that your word and your hope seeps deep into their heart. God, help them to know that no matter what they've done, where they've been, Jesus is for them, and he's bigger than anything, God. I pray that we live our lives in gratitude and trying to glorify Jesus in everything that we do. We thank you for everything. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.